this is going to be a very fast paced lecture because uh, my objective was to try to cover as much material as I could. And so if anybody is interested in addressing some specifics after the fact, then uh, I would definitely be happy to answer more questions. So we're gonna start with the very first attempts to create an all-terrain combat vehicle. The very first of these were basically quadricycle and tricycle automobiles that had a machine gun and carried a small shield. This gave basically no protection to the crew. So very quickly, people started putting armor around the body of the, of the armored car. And soon in 1905, uh, we had the first armored car that carried a turret. Uh, similar types of armored cars became the first uh, cross-country uh, combat vehicles to enter combat in 1912 during the Italo-Turkish War. And by World War I, pretty much every nation in Europe was operating fairly large fleets of armored cars. Most armored cars carry just a single machine gun turret. However, there were some that carried multiple machine gun turrets in various configurations to engage infantry in different directions. And there were also a few uh, early attempts to carry larger artillery pieces on armored cars as well. However, the issue was that armored cars generally had limited mobility on cross-country terrain, and they really did not offer the kind of stability uh, that would have been necessary to cross trenches, which were the major defensive uh, uh, type of earthwork in World War I. And so lots of nations began trying to study uh, solutions for specifically the trench crossing problem. Uh, one of the first attempted solutions was this very unusual vehicle, which was essentially a body that rolled inside of its own track. Uh, it technically did cross trenches, but it could only go forward. So it wasn't really a successful design. Uh, the Russians attempted to create a giant nine meter wheel uh, vehicle. This one was also not particularly successful and would have been very vulnerable to artillery. Uh, there were a couple of attempts at making vehicles with single tracks. However, while they were able to cross trenches going straight, they didn't have really any maneuverability to speak of. And so the best solution that was developed was the conventional tank with two rolling tracks on each side of the vehicle. Uh, so therefore, when the British introduced the first uh, tanks onto the combat, uh, into the battlefield of World War I, you had two tracks on either side of the vehicle. Uh, the reason for the raised ridge in front was to, able to be able to cross fairly large obstacles as well as to cross trenches more effectively. These early tanks that the British developed uh, came in two versions. There was the male version, which had a large sponson with an actual artillery piece inside of it. And there was the female version, which carried a slightly smaller sponson with just machine gun armament. And the idea was that these would uh, tag team together to uh, deal with different types of threats. Uh, through the rest of World War I, uh, Britain continued to upgrade this general design with giving uh, more effective engines, uh, more effective transmissions, which were slightly less prone to breakdown. And eventually, in 1918, they introduced a vehicle which had a single driver who could operate the gears, uh, the engine, and take, take, take care of all of the driving duties himself. On earlier British tanks, you actually needed to have two specific uh, crewmen dedicated to changing the gears on the different tracks. Uh, as the Germans encountered these first tanks, one of their defenses was to try to make their trenches wider so that these the early tanks were not able to cross them. And so the British first attempted to create a vehicle with an extended track. This was called the tackle tail. Unfortunately, it was not sufficiently stiff. And typically during attempted crossing of trenches, these would shear off. So this was not a very good solution. Instead, the better solution was by increasing the length of the tank in the middle, and it also allowed for sufficient space to carry some infantry inside. So in, in principle, this became the first combined tank and armored personnel carrier. Uh, the same concept was then explored for a joint British-American tank in 1919. However, World War I had ended by the time that these were available, and so they never got to see combat. Uh, France attempted to build a heavy tank of their own. Theirs was uh, rather less successful in part because their body was much wide, much longer than the tracks. And so while it was able to provide good fire support over open fields, it was not particularly good at crossing trenches. Germany would made one uh, series of tanks uh, during the First World War, but they only produced 20 of them. So they didn't really affect the war for too much. And their design ended up being a little too large, uh, much too tall to be stable. And it had way too much crew of up to 18 men, including one dedicated messenger pigeon handler. So, this was a little too large uh, to be practical. And even though Germany then attempted to make an even larger vehicle, which would have been uh, 30, 13 meters long and carried a crew of 27 men, if finished, this would have been the largest tank ever to see combat, but they just didn't quite finish uh, construction by the end of World War I. Uh, as, at the same time, large heavy tanks were very expensive. And so Britain and France uh, both started looking into options to create 
lighter and cheaper vehicles that could be produced in large numbers uh, to provide just generic fire support. Uh, the French uh, settled on the Schneider. This was a relatively compact vehicle with an artillery piece and a couple of machine guns. Uh, the British uh, focused their uh, light slash medium tank development on tanks armed with just machine guns. However, these tanks were designed specifically for speed. And the idea was that once you break a hole in an enemy defensive position, you can then have these much faster tanks be able to charge in and go much deeper into uh, enemy territory and attack unprepared German positions. Uh, in 1917, France introduced the Renault FT. This was the most produced tank of World War I and generally defined the standard tank configuration as a track vehicle that has a turret. And uh, in this case, they produced them either with gun or machine gun configurations. And uh, one additional detail is that uh, throughout the entire history of military technology, there have been quite a few attempts at taking an existing platform and adapting it to other roles. And the Renault FT is probably the best example for that in World War I, because right after uh, the base tank was produced and introduced into service, there were derivatives of it made as artillery pieces of various flavors to carry larger and heavier guns. Uh, there were radio command vehicles so that a commander could uh, send orders to an entire troop of uh, vehicles. There were bulldozers, uh, mine clearing vehicles, bridge lane vehicles, and even a uh, post-war modification specifically dedicated to either lay down smoke screens or provide chemical attack uh, built by Coleman. Uh, also, World War I saw the introduction of the very first combat robots. Uh, in 1915, the French introduced a very small uh, robot that was basically a bomb on tracks. And the idea was that they would roll this up to either enemy pillboxes or machine gun nests or into enemy trenches and blow it up. Similar designs uh, were built by other French manufacturers as well as an American design, but these particular ones did not get to see combat during the First World War. Uh, moving into the interwar period, uh, first, the First World War showed that tanks and armored combat vehicles in general are very effective. And so the general school of thought that led uh, or that evolved how to use them was to use initially uh, very heavily armored tanks with lots and lots of guns to break through an enemy front line. And then once there's a breach in the enemy front line, you would send much faster tanks to go deeper into enemy territory and begin to disrupt their positions uh, before, that, before that enemy was, particular, was prepared for an attack. And so within this school of thought, generally tanks were divided into heavy, medium, light, and there was also another class of vehicles called the tankettes. Tankettes specifically were designed essentially as their own mobile uh, machine gun pillboxes, such that if there's an infantry formation that's moving, uh, they can have heavy machine gun support along with them without having to waste time to set it up on a tripod as you would with a manual uh, tankette or as, as you would with a manual machine gun. And so the defining design for tankettes during the interwar period was the Cardin Lloyd uh, that you see here. This was a fairly open light uh, two-man vehicle carrying just a single machine gun and a driver and a commander. Uh, there was an amphibious version of this made uh, specifically designed to cross rivers and cross lakes so that you did not have to waste time either trying to seize a bridge or trying to build a bridge of your own. Uh, the Russians copied the design as their T-27, and this became their mainstay tankette uh, throughout the 1930s. And they likewise made an amphibious version as well, which was used uh, fairly large, fairly extensively during the Second World War to support infantry uh, river crossings. Poland uh, also modified this design, and they went with a heavier armament than pretty much anyone else did on their tankettes by introducing a 20 millimeter autocannon rather than just a simple machine gun. Uh, most of these vehicles were lost in combat against much better German vehicles when the when the Germans invaded Poland, however. And the Italians likewise based uh, their tankette designs on the Cardin Lloyd as well. Uh, one of their modifications was the flamethrower design, which you can see in the left photos. Uh, this one was used primarily to disrupt either heavily, heavily fortified enemy positions or also to attack enemy pillboxes and bunkers. In the world of light tanks, uh, the most popular design in the interwar period was the British, again, uh, Vickers Mark E. This was a six ton light tank that Britain itself did not purchase. However, pretty much everyone else around the world did, and they purchased licenses to produce their own versions of this. The original Vickers Marquis came with two versions, either with two light machine gun turrets or with a single turret with a heavier gun. Uh, the Russians became the most dominant user of this type of tank, and they likewise had uh, multiple versions. In this case, this is also with two different turrets. However, one of the turrets is actually carrying a small 37 millimeter anti-tank gun, and the other one is just a dedicated machine gun turret. 
1933, they introduced the definitive version of what they called the T-26 with a much larger, more powerful uh, 45 millimeter gun in a roomier turret. This generally became the most produced tank of the 1930s and made of the bulk of Russia's infantry force, infantry support tanks. Uh, in the sense that these tanks were not necessarily designed to go super quickly, but they were supposed to carry just sufficient armor to provide to provide protection for the tank against enemy machine guns, and they carried sufficiently large gun to provide fire support for friendly infantry. Uh, Poland, likewise, had a very similar tank uh, called the 7TP that they based on the same chassis. Uh, Italy based pretty much their entire tank industry on this platform. Their original design, the M1139, carried a larger gun inside the hull and then a turret with machine guns. However, once they realized that tanks are a much more dangerous threat uh, to their own tanks than enemy infantry, they switched over and put the larger gun inside the turret and then a double machine gun inside of the hull. Uh, and likewise, Czechoslovakia also based uh, some of their tank developments on the same uh, Vickers 6 turn vehicle as well. Uh, the other major lineage of tanks uh, from the 1930s was the Christie lineage. Uh, this was a design built by an American race car engineer by the name of Christie, and he had very, very large coil springs providing the suspension uh, for the wheels. This gave the wheels lots and lots of travel and gave the vehicles very good performance on cross country, uh, even uh, without uh, even without tracks. And this was because the vehicle could be set up where the rear wheel was connected to the rear drive wheel. And so you could take off the tracks and just drive this as a regular car on a road. And in this case, the front wheels themselves would steer. The Russians based a lot of their uh, what was called cavalry tanks uh, on the Christie design. And these were the BT or the fast tanks. Uh, the definitive design for this was the BT-7 and carried pretty much an identical turret to the T-26, but it was much faster and carried somewhat lesser, uh, lesser armor. So the idea was that this would be the tank that went deep into enemy lines and started disrupting enemy uh, positions there. Good question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the draft tanks typically don't have a suspension. So all tanks do have a suspension, but it depends on what the type of suspension is. So on the Vickers 6 ton, uh, they had a leaf spring suspension connecting pair to bogies. And on the Christie tank, they had coil springs. Oil springs are not commonly used because they're very voluminous compared to other types of suspensions. But because tanks at this point were fairly light, so just under 15 tons, uh, you could still use a coil spring suspension with this. But subsequently, there's other types of suspensions, and we'll talk about them once we get into those designs. Uh, Britain likewise used uh, the Christie suspension for some of their cruiser tanks uh, to the same uh, general purpose as the Russian BT series. On the American side, they used a different suspension called the vertical volume spring suspension. So a volume spring is essentially a sheet of steel, which is rolled into a little roulette. And that particular uh, design allows you for a much more compact suspension, which carries the same weight. So on the US side, uh, the first vehicle to carry the suspension was the M1 combat car, which ironically was called this way because Congress didn't allow cavalry to have tanks. So they just renamed it to combat car and carried, uh, carried on. There was a subsequent design that uh, the U.S. also experimented with a twin gun uh, machine gun vehicle, but they likewise decided that this is not really solving the problem of engaging enemy tanks. And so they went with a more conventional design with a single large turret with an anti-tank gun. Uh, this eventually evolved into the standard M3 Stewart that was used by the U.S. during the uh, Second World War. And in this case, uh, the early Stewarts had relatively uh, low armor protection compared to uh, some of the later light tanks. And this led to problems when uh, they were encountering heavy anti-tank German gun anti-tank guns that Germany was using in North Africa, for instance. And so the M5 Stewart introduced in 1943 uh, provided much better protection on the upper glacis, especially. This is the upper front armor plate of the tank. And this gave the, these vehicles much better survivability against enemy anti-tank fire. The Japanese had a very interesting suspension called the Hara suspension, where there was a single gigantic coil spring running along the length of the vehicle connecting pairs of bogies that could swivel around along the central uh, pivot. And this horror suspension was used for most of their vehicles. So their most common design was the Type 95 Hago, uh, generally comparable to most of the other light tanks where just a single gun with an or a single turret with an anti-tank gun and a uh, machine gun in the hull. There was an interesting derivative of this called the Kami, which was amphibious. It had detachable pontoons, which uh, would be attached on a ship or as it was about to enter water. And then after it exited onto the beach that it was trying to storm, the crew inside could just pull a lever, detach the pontoons, and then be on their way without having to 
to expose themselves to enemy fire while detaching the pontoons. Another question. Uh, I've noticed consistently there's only one engine in all of these tanks. Uh, there's no there's no dual engine, one for one side and the other side, one for the front, one for the rear, that type of stuff. Correct. So generally, you use a single engine because it's just easier to package. Uh, there were some cases where two engines being used if it's cheaper to go with those engines. And we'll actually see one example of that in just a couple of slides. But for the most part, it's just easier to package a single engine and keep it in a confined compartment that you can isolate away from the crew. And from a steering standpoint, there's a skid steer. This is not an active steer. Correct. So all tanks, except for the Christie design, where it was driven off of tracks, were typically driven with two tiller bars, just like a tractor. And so generally you would do skid steer, but it was recommended not to do full skid steer back forward on opposite tracks because this would throw track very easily. And so typically what you would do is you would drive one track slowly in one direction and then the other track much quicker. So we would trace our circle. And the difference in speed is taken care of by the transmission. Correct. Takes yep. Care yeah. So typically there would be a separate gearbox for each of the tracks coming off of the single engine. Uh, the Russians, uh, in 1941, after they lost pretty much all of their pre-war light tanks, they began production of a much cheaper design called the T-60. This used a truck engine, automotive suspension, or automotive transmission, and as cheap of a suspension and armor plating as possible. Uh, for the weapon for this one, they also went with an aviation autocannon, which was already produced in large numbers. And this was primarily there just to plug the gap that for all of the tanks that they lost during the first uh, six months of World War II. And then in 1942, they introduced an upgraded version. This one of those examples that does have two engines because they wanted to have more, mo more mobility for this vehicle, but they still wanted to use a simple truck engine instead of developing a dedicated engine and taking time away from the worker to do that. Uh, there were a couple of attempts to create uh, tanks specifically for glider. So in this case, this is the Hamil Hamilcar glider. And there were two tanks developed specifically to fit in that so that you could send them over the English Channel to support uh, paratroopers. Uh, the British design was called the Tatrarch and the American design was called the Locust. Uh, both of them had very, very thin armor and so they were not particularly successful in combat because they could be easily taken out by enemy anti-tank guns. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, the Americans introduced the M24 JP. This was technically still classified as a light tank, but as far as performance, armor, weapon, and uh, everything else, it was better than the medium tanks that were used at the beginning of World War II. So this just shows that at the in those just short short six years, you went from classifying something that would have been medium into now what is a light tank. And it's ironic that it's a light tank but with two engines. Yes. In this case, like likewise, this was just a cheap solution because they had cheap engines that were available from earlier projects, and they could just cram them in in large numbers. Uh, on the world of medium tanks, uh, most medium tanks that were developed in the early 1920s were basically just a repeat of the same concept from World War uh, I, just now introducing turrets and slightly better armor and armament. Uh, there were uh, developments in the 1930s that looked at increasing the firepower of medium tanks, specifically by adding extra turrets. So in this case, you see there is a single main turret with a main gun and then two side turrets with just machine guns. Uh, the Russians were fairly fond of this concept as well, and they produced uh, a few similar configurations for them for the Air Army. And the same kind of configuration was still used up into the beginning of World War II uh, with the tanks like the A-9 Cruiser. Uh, the Germans uh, developed what kind of became the standard definition for a medium tank in World War II. They had two vehicles uh, that were used. The Panzer III initially was intended as the anti-tank vehicle, where it had a relatively good 37 millimeter gun for 1930s. Uh, once combat actually started, they saw that this gun was insufficient. And so they fairly quickly upgraded it to a much more capable 50 and then a, an even longer 50 uh, millimeter gun. And later derivatives of the Panzer III also carried these additional armor shields on the side of the hull as well as of the turret. And these were primarily there to prevent uh, enemy projectiles from hitting the tank quite as easily. And primarily, against anti-tank rifles and autocannons, because generally on tanks, side armor is going to be much thinner because a tank is very heavy. So you're going to focus your armor protection on the front so that when you are attacking an enemy position, that's where you're going to be hit, hit at uh, most of the time. And so if you can enhance your side protection by just these relatively thin plates on the side, that helps improve the survivability without adding way too much weight. Uh, 
The other medium tank the Germans started World War II with was the Panzer IV. Initially, they intended to use this just as an infantry support vehicle and this a very, a very short stubby uh, 75 millimeter gun. This was woefully inadequate as well. And so fairly quickly, they transformed that into a 75 millimeter anti-tank gun, which likewise grew in length. And uh, towards 1943, they likewise began upgrading this with spaced armor as well. Uh, the Russians, they took their BT series, which were the Christie designs. Uh, first thing that they did was in 1939, they sloped the armor in. Uh, the reason that they sloped the armor in is that for a tank, most projectiles are coming in horizontally. And so if you slope the armor, the horizontal thickness of the armor becomes greater by one over the cosine of the angle. And so this allowed them to keep the weight uh, the same, but improve the effective armor protection. Uh, subsequently, they realized that they still need to keep improving the armor protection, at which point the tank was way too heavy to actually go without tracks. And so they removed the idea of being able to detach the tracks and drive directly on wheels and developed a fully tracked tank, which eventually became the most fam the famous T-34. Uh, the initial T-34s went into production with a relatively short and stubby 76 millimeter gun, which was upgraded uh, to the definitive uh, 76 L-42 in uh, 1941. Uh, they also upgraded in 1942 the design of the turret specifically to give a cupola to the commander because the original design had very poor visibility and the commander was basically blind to threats behind him and to the side. And so by adding the cupola with extra view slits, it improved the uh, situational awareness of the commander and made, made him uh, better able to address and detect enemy threats. <laughs> Is that a so that is a captured Finnish tank. Uh, the Finnis captured a very large number of T-34s, which they used in their own forces as well. And so this is an example of the tank at the Finnish Museum in Parola. Uh, there were a couple of attempts to improve the armament uh, even further. Uh, the first attempt put a long barrel 57 millimeter gun. This was very good in the anti-tank world. However, it was very limited in the high explosive uh, round that it could use. And so it was not as effective against enemy infantry or against fortifications. And so instead, they went with a much more capable 85 millimeter gun, which became the next definitive version of the T-34, uh, starting with early 1944. Uh, there was also an attempt to upgrade it to an even more powerful 100 millimeter gun, but the turret was too small to allow for this gun to be used. And so we had to wait until uh, the late 1940s for the 100 millimeter gun to become standard on newer Russian medium tanks. Uh, the British side. They still uh, continue upgrading their Christie lineage as well. Uh, initially with the Crusader, which early versions had a single machine gun turret up in front of the hull. However, they realized this is way too cramped and doesn't really give you all of the benefits that they were expecting. So it was removed and subsequent tanks focused on improving the armor production as well as improving the armament. And the final step of this particular lineage was a tank called the Comet, which uh, used the famous British 17 pounder gun which was generally considered to be the best anti-tank gun of the Allied forces during World War II. Uh, on the American side, they used the same basic design that they had from their uh, light tanks with the volume spring suspension, and they introduced a larger version as the M2 medium tank. Uh, this had a crew of six, but nine machine guns, because at the time the US Army really liked their machine guns. Uh, and the only real main gun that it used at the time was just a 37 millimeter, which was woefully inadequate by 1940. And so uh, work began on upgrading the weapons of the tank to a much larger gun. The first design was the M3 Lee. This was a compromise design because they needed to have a larger gun available to British uh, forces fighting in North Africa, but they didn't have time to produce larger turrets at the time. And so instead they went with the same 37 millimeter gun and a small turret, and then a larger 75 millimeter gun and a side sponsor on the vehicle. Was this the one that was made in uh, Warren? Yes. So this was the first thing that was built at the arsenal uh, in 1942. Uh, there was also a British version of this uh, where it redes they redesigned the turret to provide room for the radio because Britain liked to have radios in their turrets. So this was a custom version uh, built specifically for the British Army. And finally, uh, 1942, once uh, larger turret manufacturing became available, uh, the US introduced the M4 Sherman. Uh, this was produced in very large numbers and quite a few configurations. Uh, the baseline vehicle had a 75 millimeter all-purpose gun, which was fairly good against tanks and generally very good against infantry and fairly cheap and available in very large numbers. There was a dedicated anti-tank version, which had a much larger and longer 76 millimeter gun. Uh, the British had their own anti-tank version as well, where they uh, put their 17 pounder into the turret of the Sherman. And in this case, because uh, the 17 pounder took up so much space, 
they actually had to cut a hole in the back and attach an extra box uh, for the radio equipment that they wanted to carry in the church. Question. You mentioned radio, but I haven't seen much of it in terms of an antenna on India. So, well, part of the reason is because most of the museum vehicles that I have photos of I already have those equi that equipment removed because it rusts fairly easily. Uh, but during World War II, you would see antennas sticking out on the service vehicles. Uh, there was also a fortification demolition vehicle, uh, which carried a 105 millimeter gun, which was specifically there to attack uh, bunkers and pillboxes. And there was also a uh, Sherman Jumbo, which basically slapped on an extra five inches of armor to the front uh, of the hull and the turret. And they used this basically as just a diehard brawler to go in up close to German anti-tank positions and keep shooting them until they are taken out. Which one was the one you done uh, I will get to that. Uh, that is coming up. Uh, then in 1942, there was a series of modifications to the basic Sherman design where the original Sherman was a very tall vehicle because the front of the vehicle had the transmission, but the back of the vehicle had the engine. And so they needed to have a giant uh, crankshaft running down the length of the entire tank. So what they did with the T20 medium tank was they integrated the transmission and the engine into a single block and put it in the back, moved the turret forward, and this allowed them to reduce the height of the vehicle considerably. While this vehicle was not used in combat, it did eventually lead to the development of the next generation medium tank, and we'll see that in a couple of slides. Okay. That is Detroit Arsenal, yep. Uh, there was also a version of the T20, which carried one of the first autoloader designs uh, developed in 1943. Unfortunately, this autoloader was not particularly reliable mechanically, and so we had to wait for a couple of more decades for autoloaders to begin uh, to see large-scale use on tanks. Uh, on the Japanese side, uh, their medium tanks were basically a repeat on what we saw with our light tanks by just increasing the length. Uh, and with them, they likewise entered the war initially with a relatively stubby gun because they were expecting primarily infantry support duties. And they had to upgrade it to a much better anti-tank gun once they actually started encountering lots of allied tanks uh, in the Pacific. Uh, they made a couple of attempts at making very powerful vehicles, but all of these were held back within Japan to defend it against the expected American invasion, which never came. So all of these tanks never actually got to see combat. Uh, there was a very interesting design that they came up with in 43, which uh, was also an amphibious tank like we saw with their light amphibious tank. But this one was completely uh, pressurized so that you could strap it onto a submarine and you could transport it underwater to an area where you're maybe interested in laying out an attack, primarily because they were so wary of American air power. And so they figured if we send these tanks submerged so that they're more difficult to detect from the air, then we can send a secret attack much more effectively. And when you say amphibious, forgive my ignorance, are we only talking shallow water or are we talking deep water? Today? Deep water. Can we totally submerged. So, well, so these vehicles uh, were completely pressurized, so they could be submerged to the same depth as a submarine, which is about 100 meters, uh, effectively. Uh, the earlier tank that we saw could be uh, submerged up to the deck, but the turret itself was not watertight. So if water sloshed over the deck, then you could have some intrusion of water through the turret. Were these ever used in combat? No, so these were attempted to be used a couple of times, but bo both of those operations were called off at the last minute. Uh, and then at the end of uh, World War II, what, like we saw with the with the light tank, or with the medium tank becoming a light, we saw much heavier medium tanks uh, sort of becoming the new, uh, or much heavier medium tanks almost encroaching into the realm of heavy vehicles. Uh, and these primarily focused on lots and lots of frontal armor protection and very powerful anti-tank guns. And generally, these became the standard for post-war medium tank development. So on the German side, they developed the Panther, which was a very, very good tank uh, after initial uh, mechanical problems were resolved. On the American side, they took that T-20 that we saw, gave it a much larger turret with a very powerful 90 millimeter gun. This became the Pershing. And this was the standard uh, American medium tank just at the end of World War II uh, uh, as it began to supplement the Sherman. Uh, and on the British side, they introduced a vehicle called the Centurion, which was a what they called a universal tank, where it improved both infantry tanks, which were well armored, and cavalry tanks, which were mobile. It combined both of those concepts and created a universal tank, which was both well protected and very mobile. Initially, they came with a relatively uh, complexly shaped cast turret, but then they realized that they could improve the armor protection by adding more armor. And so they introduced the standard 
uh, Centurion turret in 1945. And this turret still remains in use with some armies, such as South Africa, they use upgraded Centurions to this day. And we'll see those in a couple of slides. Uh, in the world of heavy tanks, uh, pretty much everyone began by focusing on what they called land dreadnoughts with lots and lots and lots of turrets. Uh, the French began this trend in 1921 when they built the CM2C. This had a single large turret in the front, a couple of machine guns out in front, and then a secondary machine gun turret all the way in the back. Uh, Britain won up them in 1926 by creating a tank with five turrets, a single turret for a main gun, and then four turrets with machine guns. And then Russia took that design and made it even more capable by adding two anti-tank guns to two of those turrets. So this was the epitome of land battleship design. However, engineers fairly soon realized that because a vehicle so large cannot carry heavy armor, it's going to be very vulnerable to enemy anti-tank fire. And so instead, they subsequently focused on more compact designs, in this case, just with two turrets, but carrying thicker armor that was able to protect them better. Uh, there were a couple of different versions of this made, and they realized that with something as long as this, its turnability is not really great. It is way too heavy. It's very difficult to maintain. And so there was a student project out of, uh, I believe, Harkov, where they just took this design, shortened it down to a single turret, and that became the KV. So this was the Russian standard heavy tank uh, pretty much all throughout World War II as it continuously uh, gained upgrades. The basic design actually carried the exact same gun as we saw in the T-34, which was their medium tank. They had an attempt to see if they could put both guns that they had on their twin turret tank into a single turret. Uh, technically, there was space, but it was very difficult to use in service, and so this was never actually used past one single prototype. Uh, there was also a dedicated anti-fortification vehicle with a 152 millimeter gun, uh, but this one was really just an issue specifically just to take out enemy pillboxes. Another question. Other than combat-related mm -hmm. uh, damage, today, where do they fail? For example, do they have rollovers with these tanks? Do they have uh, the tracks slipping out of the wheels, etc.? Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of, well, okay, track slipping off is very, very common. So every tank crew, even in training, has dozens of incidents when the track slips off, even with modern tanks. And so they're all trained how to get out and then uh, disassemble the track at some particular location and then roll it back onto the, onto the right train and then relink the tracks together. Uh, as far as damage, most of these early vehicles were still running with 1940s engines. So the engines themselves uh, were not very reliable. They would conk out, they would have piston damage. Uh, they may have uh, deformation of the drive shaft. And so in that case, you would actually have to replace the entire engine. And then transmissions at the time were also not particularly good uh, in terms of precision. So after a couple of hundred thousand cycles, you would start having fatigue set in, and so you'd be breaking wheels on your gears and so on. And so most damage for these early tanks was primarily because either their transmission broke down or their engine overheated and also broke down. But in terms of, I don't mean to belabor it, mm -hmm. you have somebody sitting in a, in a, um, yeah, in, <laughs> in a cabin with mm -hmm. not necessarily full, full view of the mm -hmm. world, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so the question I was asking is whether, you know, due to misjudgments, they roll these things over oh. uh, around, you know, around, uh, you know, the side slopes and so yep. on and so forth. Yeah, so rollover definitely happens uh, to this day as well. Uh, but part of that is training the crew how to identify rollover. And then the other part is that you never really use tanks in a complete vacuum. You always use them together with friendly infantry, there is scouts sent ahead. And so generally speaking, unless somebody makes a mistake, you already plan out your advance on a map where you know where the slopes are. And so unless you have to do like last minute maneuvering, like you're trying to avoid an anti-tank gun, generally you're intended to avoid those risks, that risk of rollover ahead of the operation. So the weapon trails an infantry? I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive to a, a naive civilian. So the idea is that you use tanks as infantry support because Tanks on their own are very vulnerable to pretty much everything because you cannot really see there's a tank and an anti-tank gun all, over, all the way over in the bush over there. And so uh, the infantry would provide additional information to tanks, but also infantry is much better at actually holding ground because if you have a swarm of infantry, the swarm of infantry will always take out a tank, but a swarm of infantry will have a much more difficult time taking out an enemy swarm of infantry.
And so tanks are there essentially to bring artillery to the front line to provide that for the infantry, but the infantry are still the main force that actually sees it in the whole ground. And the infantry precedes the tank. And the tank is basically like a backup infantry. So that depends. Uh, in some operations, when you are breaking, let's say, an initial defensive line, you send in just the tanks because you need to have something that's very well armored and taking on taking all of the damage. Once you've broken through, then usually you would, uh, let's say you break through a breach, then you send forces sideways so that they start taking, let's say, other defensive areas in the same area. And in this case, you would have infantry and tanks moving together. Uh, when you have your deep penetration operations going in, usually you would have your fast tanks together with truck-mounted infantry so that when they do encounter a threat, the infantry rapidly dismounts from the trucks and they go into combat together with the tanks. And these are trucks. Then one value proposition of the of the tank is that it can go into art to go in, mm -hmm. right? From a traction perspective yep. or a terrain perspective. And this, this truck notion, truck carrying soldiers, etc., is a feasible companion to this, despite the, the challenges with green vehicles. So I'm not going to address this particular topic too much in this lecture, but that is why tracked infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers have been developed since World War II. Uh, during World War II, especially Russia, didn't really have tracked vehicles that could carry infantry in large numbers, and so they used trucks because that was what was available. The Germans used half track vehicles, which basically used the same long track, but with a pair of wheels and a regular steering wheel. They used those for their infantry transport. But at the time, it was primarily just what happened to be available in large enough numbers to be useful. Uh, the other point to that, though, is that a tank is much heavier than a truck. And so if you have a truck which only weighs a couple of tons and carrying a couple of dozen infantry or like a dozen infantry or so, then its mobility would be not too far off from a tank as long as you're not going into actual mud. And because most combat happened over, let's say, grassy fields or fairly dry step terrain, uh, trucks were still somewhat comparable to tanks as far as going over simple terrain is concerned. Uh, in 1943, when the Russians encountered much better protected German vehicles uh, like the Panther, and as we're going to see the Tiger, they introduced a longer 85 millimeter gun onto the KV. This was, again, the same gun that they introduced later on to the T-34-85. And in 1944, they introduced a 122 millimeter gun. Uh, this uh, was specifically dedicated to attack fortifications rather than enemy tanks. So this was one of the few examples where, uh, again, you have an, a tank specifically against uh, stationary targets rather than a general all-purpose vehicle. And in 1945, just as, the, as World War II was ending, they introduced what's called the IS-3. This was the first Russian tank that had the classic mushroom dome turret that allowed for even better armor protection because the slope angle was much stiffer than what you could do with a more conventionally shaped turret. Uh, in uh, Europe, uh, France and Britain specifically, we're looking at uh, similar uh, very heavy tanks specifically dedicated to attack enemy fortifications. And uh, with some of their early designs, they likewise had a single howitzer in the hull and then an anti-tank gun in the turret because generally fortifications don't run away from you and other tanks do. Uh, the British had a very similar design on their first generation Churchill. This was the standard British heavy tank of World War II, but they fairly, pre, uh, fairly quickly, uh, just like the Russians, realized that uh, there's not really that many fortifications on most combat zones. And so subsequent versions of the Churchill focused on improving armor protection in the front, where the howitzer used to be, and improving the gun that was actually inside the turret so that this was a better anti-tank gun, uh, anti-tank vehicle in general. And likewise, there were also a couple of dedicated versions specifically with large caliber howitzers and large caliber mortars specifically to take out enemy fortifications. Uh, there was also an attempt at creating an, a dedicated anti-tank Churchill called the Black Prince, but this forced them to widen the hull out way too much. And this design ended up too heavy for the engine that they provided, and thus uh, was not used. And on the German side, uh, they uh, used were the famous Tiger, probably the most famous tank of World War II, uh, their design was specifically intended to bring the firepower of their 88 millimeter anti-tank gun and drop it onto a vehicle so that uh, they didn't have to just uh, have the gun logged around by truck. Uh, they went with much heavier armor than pretty much any, anyone had available in 1842, millimeters, both in front of the hull and of the turret. And they went with a interleaved uh, suspension, interleaved uh, wheels, all of which were supported by torsion bar suspension. So this was one of the early tanks 
that had a torsion bar suspension where there's just a single bar of steel, which is fixed on one end on one side of the hull. It, it protrudes out the other side and it goes out to a lever, lever arm connected to the wheel. And so as the wheel is elevated over terrain, it induces torsion in the full bar. And then the torsion then forces the wheel back down because it's basically, basically acting like a torsion spring. Uh, in 1944, they introduced an upgraded version uh, called the King Tiger. This had improved armor by uh, improved the armor protection by clothing it and carried a much more powerful, longer 88 millimeter gun. Uh, this was the heaviest tank that was used in combat in World War II. I noticed that the engine crossbar is almost 10x what it was previously. It's because of the heavy arms that it's carrying. Correct. So part of that was because engines that were this powerful were available now. Uh, engines of this power would have been uh, maybe three or four times larger in volume uh, back in the 1930s. And so people didn't really develop tanks to the size because no engines were available. But now that there was better engine development, uh, better materials prop, uh, materials property control when you're manufacturing all these components, you could have these more compact engines, which allowed for the development of these heavier tanks with better armor and better guns. Uh, and likewise, uh, what we talked about with the Renault FT, uh, most vehicles of World War II were modified to quite a variety of roles uh, because you already have a platform, so you can just drop extra modules on it instead of having to develop something brand new. Uh, and the example that I'm going to give for World War II was the Sherman. So this is the Sherman DD uh, that Professor Munch mentioned. Uh, this was a amphibious vehicle that could elevate an amphibious screen around uh, the body. And in this case, it was able to go through relatively calm water. Uh, and then once he got to the beach, you could just pull a single lever and it would deflate all of these airbags. The entire screen would collapse and you were ready to go into combat as an actual tank. But the English Channel was not relatively calm water at the end. Correct. But the English, yes. yep. Except the one my, my grandfather was in one and his captain of the boat said, I'm not dropping, I'm dropping off on the beach. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, there is no, you know, because these bodies have to take on fire. There's mm -hmm. no compromise design-wise for this inflatable balloon in the middle. So the basic vehicle inside is the same. So there's no compromise on its armor. Uh, technically there's compromise because the screen itself is completely unarmored. So if you do take on fire, uh, the screen is gonna fill up with water and you will sink. But the thought was, if you have enough of them, it's gonna be difficult for the enemy to fight, to shoot all of them. And so you're going to have at least some tanks making it all the way to the enemy beach. And this would have been ad more advantageous than taking a dedicated ship, where the ship is an even more vulnerable target than a bunch of individual targets that you have to take out. And when it's deflated, and when the, you know, the, 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 the current mm -hmm. with the with hull, the mm -hmm. there is no design compromise on vulnerability there, meaning I think it's sort of like a band around the tank. Correct. So when it is deflated, it's basically just a canvas screen. So canvas doesn't really do, it neither takes away nor adds to the armor. It's just there. And so once the screen is down for all intents and purposes, it's basically back to being a regular curve. Is that a window on the side? That is a, well, that's a window on the side so that museum visitors could see what, what it looks like. Yeah, it was top secret back then. It didn't work. Yep. Well, it did work during river crossings right. later on. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the Sherman was also used to make quite a few derivatives of uh, various tank destroyers. These were dedicated vehicles with somewhat less armor protection, but a heavier gun so that they could specifically focus on taking out enemy tanks uh, of many different flavors. Self-propelled artillery of quite a few different flavors, as well as rocket vehicles. So in World War II saw the first uh, examples of people firing rockets off of their tanks. And this would be done either from uh, launchers that were firing single rockets at a time, multiple rocket launchers of, again, quite a few different flavors. Uh, there was an attempt at making a dedicated anti-aircraft tank. Uh, anti-aircraft vehicles have become more common since World War II, but this was one of the first examples of putting a dedicated vehicle specifically to take out enemy aircraft because Germany had demonstrated that uh, well, uh, well-practiced anti-tank Flying units were very capable during the first part of the Second World War. And then the Allies showed that their own units are likewise capable against the Germans. And so there was always a need for some vehicles dedicated to shoot down or at least ward off enemy attacking aircraft so that they do not hit you uh, on target. Uh, there was an attempt to put a large illumination light so that uh, the battlefield could be illuminated at night. 
Uh, that ended about as well as you might expect. Uh, there was also a very interesting design of a Sherman, which was modified specifically to carry infantry. Uh, this was one of the first uh, very heavily armored armor personnel carriers, uh, and we will see similar designs to that uh, later on. And there was also quite a large variety of Shermans dedicated to uh, mine clearance. Uh, the most famous one had the flail, but there were also quite a few with different configurations of rollers, uh, plows, and even pile drivers that would hit the ground and attempt to blow up landmines ahead of the tank. Uh, as well as this interesting design that fired a spread of rockets and used the detonation of all the rockets to clear out entire minefields in a single go. Uh, and there were likewise quite a few variants of uh, Shermans with flamethrowers, both flamethrowers inside the hull, flamethrowers inside the turret, uh, flamethrowers carried behind uh, as part as per the British pattern, uh, as well as flamethrowers inside a turretless tank uh, as well. And again, uh, oh, can they do a pink, pink shadow? Now, you talked at length about the body mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with the mine vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Is there a fortification of the hull uh, on the bottom with more metal and more thickness, et cetera? Not at this time. So at the time, there was no extra armor on the base on the bottom of the hull because you're limited on weight. Uh, generally, you know you will be hit from the front. So you have to have armor on the front. You are also fairly certain that you're probably going to be hit on the side. So the side is the second most important part to protect. As far as mines are concerned, if your operation is planned well, you're supposed to send in sappers ahead of you so that they tell you where the landmine or where the minefield is and you can avoid it, or you're going to go with mine clearing devices. So if you happen to hit landmines, that was considered to be a justifiable risk because creating sufficient protection under the body for full protection against landmines would have made the tank far too heavy to be practical. And plus the other thing is that generally the thing that the landmine took out was the tracks and there's not really any practical way to make the tracks sufficiently sturdy against a 30 kilogram explosive charge. And so that was just a, a threat that had to be addressed with by other means than just increasing armor protection. Uh, and likewise, uh, to finish off this section, uh, their Sherman was also modified into quite a few vehicles for recovery of damaged vehicles back to a friendly position, uh, including a vehicle that was designed to recover vehicles that got stranded during a beach operation, so it would wade out to fairly deep water and then bring those vehicles back on shore. And there was also a dedicated bridge laying vehicle, but instead of laying down its own bridge, it acted as the bridge by extending out two sections and using its own body to support the weight of vehicles crossing over it. And uh, to close the World War II section, World War II saw continued development of robots. So we saw the first robots uh, in World War I, where it was just a self-propelled, uh, essentially explosive charge. Uh, France continued this development through the 1920s and 30s, and they had them in fairly large configurations. So this was about small car-sized to much smaller vehicles that were specifically dedicated to anti-tank duties, where the idea was that they would drive under an enemy tank and then blow it up. Uh, the British copied the same uh, concept as did the Russians and as did the Germans and the German Goliath was the most uh, most produced of these self-propelled anti-tank landmines of World War II. But World War II also saw uh, robotic vehicles being used for more innovative uh, uses, such as dedicated mine clearance vehicles that the Germans developed. In this case, it was a robotic vehicle just carrying a bunch of mine rollers in front of itself uh, to clear out a path for friendly tanks. Uh, there was also a dedicated uh, demolition vehicle which could deliver an explosive charge and then drive away to safety so that you could reuse the robot multiple times. Uh, and there were a couple of attempts on the US side to take uh, Shermans with mine rollers and transform them into robotic mine clearance vehicles as well. Uh, and the most uh, adventurous designs of robots during the 1930s were by the Russians where they attempted to make an actual remote controlled tank. Uh, the first attempt was the TT-18 and this was just a conventional TAT tank, but with a radio control set that could drive the tank around and rotate the turret. At this time, they didn't have any armament. This was just a proof of concept. But in 1936, they introduced the KTT-26. This was a robotic flamethrower tank where it could drive up to a target and then engage the target with a flamethrower. It also had an onboard smoke generator and also an onboard explosive charge. So if you needed to blow it up, uh, primarily to either take out an enemy fortification or to prevent the enemy from capturing your secrets, you could do that as well. Uh, there was also a BT version of the same thing where the same system went onto the past tank and created a robotic flamethrower tank. Now, I've heard from multiple people that the United States' position on robotic labor is 
being able to deliver a, a weapon or, or, or act as a, mm -hmm. as a, uh, as a charge, uh, there's always a human in the loop. That, that, that there is a decision to fire or a decision to, you know, explode by, by a soldier always mm -hmm. in the loop. Is that true with other people too? Well, so for the U.S., it is true for vehicles that they consider robots, but not true for vehicles that everyone's already accepted. So, for instance, a cruise missile or a self-guided anti-aircraft missile has no human in the loop. So once you say fire, the missile does its own thing. And technically, that missile is a robot. But missiles are like everyone's already used to self-guided missiles. And so it's like, OK, great. So the yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. I think the distinction I've heard made is that somebody makes a decision to launch. Correct. Yep. And so similarly in the Navy, there is a system called a phalanx close and weapon system, which is basically a machine gun with a bunch of radars. And that one's intended to protect a ship against an incoming missile. So once someone presses the button and says, okay, you're free to take out these missiles, the system is fully autonomous because it is far too quick. For, or a human will never have the reaction speed to intercept a missile going at Mach 1 at low, at low altitude. And so you have some automation on these weapon systems. So the question about having a robotic vehicle doing the same thing is more of just a matter of semantics, to be, to be honest. Because you could say, you could make the same use case where it's a robot and you're going to say, okay, go there and engage a target uh, and just press a button. And that would be similar to saying to the missile, hey, fly over there and engage that target. I am like the same thing. Yep. So the, the mm -hmm. so this is a lot that I have also because uh, if we got a uh, thing for a simple a robot thing, what would be the drawback to this robot or this get out? I suppose I'm uh, totally uh, in the quick tank of today's today, mm -hmm. but remote control. This this doesn't make sense because I don't know how because why do you to have this today? They so we, we will discuss that at the end of this presentation because uh, I cover that exactly there. Yeah. Uh so now going into the Cold War, right after World War II, uh you had continued development of pre-existing medium tanks which were basically just developing what was done earlier, but with better armor protection and better guns. So for instance, the M26 Pershing that we saw became the pattern with a much more streamlined turret, which was very well protected from the front. And uh, this was also upgraded to the M48, which had a better gun and better protection for both the turret and the hull. Uh, on the Russian side, they had a new vehicle called the T-54, uh, which likewise used a torsion bar suspension. So torsion bars became the standard suspension for pretty much every tank of the Cold War. Uh, and it had that 100 millimeter gun that they were not able to fit into a T-34 because now this had a much larger turret. Uh, this evolved into the T-54 model 1951, which had the more classic dome-shaped turret to improve protection and prevent something called a shot trap. A shot trap is basically where there's a ingress on the armor and it forces the an incoming shell to bounce in and actually hit the tank even more destructively. And so by eliminating that shot trap, it improved the protection of the vehicle. And uh, 1958, they introduced the T-55, which was integrated with NBC protection. So they basically, this is an internal overpressure system so that if there's a hole in the tank, like for instance, the hole for the machine gun, uh, there's always air rushing out of the vehicle and it prevents incoming radioactive dust or bacteriological agents from entering the vehicle through those uh, gaps. Huh? Yes, so there is an air intake and the air intake has a very good quality filter and then it passes that filtered air inside the vehicle to rush back outside. And the, and the sort of the air passage through, mm -hmm. the, through the gun itself, through the, I don't know what it's called. But the, yep, the gun, the barrel. Yeah, the barrel of it. Is, there is, there is, uh, that can be protected, meaning there's no leak through there. Correct. So the gun is closed most of the time. The only time that the gun is open is when you are loading around. And that is a very short time period. So the idea was that it's sufficiently short that you're allowing your overpressure to blow anything that might have built up inside the gun. And then once you close the breach back up, now it's sealed. Right. <laughs> yep. Uh, in 1961, they introduced the T-62. This was an improvement specifically for the firepower. This was now a smooth bore gun that allowed them to use these much longer rounds, which were much better at penetrating enemy uh, armor. And the reason that you wanted a smooth bore gun is that these rounds, because they are very long but narrow, 
they are aerodynamically unstable. And so you want to have these fins that provide stability for the rounds as they're flying. But if you send this kind of round through a rifle barrel, it would induce spin, and that would actually induce even more tumbling because of the fins. And so now you had to introduce a smooth bore gun that was able to fire these, uh, they're called armor-piercing fin stabilized discarding stable uh, ammunition. Uh, the French had experimented with something called the oscillating turret in the 1950s. The, here you have the gun and the turret, basically a solid object, and the entire turret pivots up and down. This makes it very easy to integrate an autoloader because the autoloader is always in line with the gun. But the issue with that, you cannot really seal this entire giant gap against radioactive intrusion. And so for that reason, after a couple of experiments, oscillating turrets generally fell out of favor. The US experimented with a couple of oscillating turret designs as well, but again, for the same reason that everyone was afraid of nuclear contamination, uh, that design was not really pursued. And the value proposition of the oscillation is to give you some vertical range in terms of firing? Well, yeah, so on a conventional tank, the turret remains stationary and the gun itself does the elevation. But this means that if you have a mechanical autoloader in the back of the turret, the gun has to be brought back down to level every time that you load. And so if your turret rotates together with the gun, then you don't need to like lose, tar lose sight of your target and keep sight on target and increase the speed that you can reload because you're not wasting an extra second to bring that gun back down. Uh, in 1969, the Russians introduced the T-64A. Generally, the Russians consider this to be the first main battle tank uh, because it took the basic dimensions of a medium tank, but gave it the protection and the firepower of a heavy tank. And so main battle tanks are generally just a merging of the medium and heavy tank category together. And the reason that they were able to get much better protection was that this was the first production tank that had composite ceramic armor, where the armor of the turret as well as the front of the hull had these ceramic balls and ceramic plates inserted. Ceramics are much lighter than steel, but they give fairly good armor protection as well. And so this allowed them to increase the thickness of the armor without over, overly increasing the weight of the vehicle itself. This was also the first tank that carried an autoloader as a mass-produced vehicle. And in this case, the autoloader was this large turret though that sat inside of the turret. And it was able to choose from one of three different types of rounds. And the only thing that the gutter needed to do was just push the button for the kind of round. The autoloader would automatically cycle to the next round that was tagged with that particular type and would automatically load it into the gun. Uh, there was an upgrade to this tank in 1976, where it became the first uh, tank that could also fire a missile from the regular main gun. And once again, because this is a smoothbore gun, the missile is not spun to smithereens while it's being launched. And so that allows you to have an internal laser designator and essentially use the tank both as a regular tank as well as a guided missile launcher. Uh, the T-72 introduced in 1973 was basically a cheaper version of the T-64. It had a simpler engine, a much simpler and cheaper autoloader, and initially just a plain steel turret. And this was intended for both just the max Soviet army as well as export orders. But in 1979, they introduced an upgraded version which introduced ceramic armor both again in the hull as well as in the turret. And they upgraded the electronics for this as well to allow it to use the same kind of guided missiles that uh, the T-64 was using. Uh, 1978, the Russians introduced the T-80. This was basically a T-64 uh, in the, with the same kind of autoloader, but with a much better suspension. This was generally considered to be the best suspension of Soviet Cold War tanks uh, and a turbine engine, which gave it much better acceleration and much better speed. Uh, and starting in the 80s, 1985, all of these tanks received upgrades of something that's called explosive reactive armor, where the armor is, uh, the baseline armor remains the same, but over it, you put these bricks that are themselves filled with explosive, so that when you have an incoming round, the explosion disrupts the armor penetrating effect of the round, and it helps you reduce the penetration. So in general, these are more effective against RPGs and anti-tank guided missiles that actually use a jet from a shape charge to do uh, to penetrate the armor, but later designs uh, are also slightly effective against kinetic penetrators as well. And so uh, same kind of armor uh, ERA was introduced on the T-72 as well as the T-80. Uh, the T-90 uh, was an upgrade to the T-72, which now carried a what's called a soft elastic protection system. It's these two giant lights that glow in infrared. And the idea was that if you have an incoming missile that's trying to find a laser designator, this is shining much brighter than the laser and it basically blinds the missile and the missile flies into some regular or into some unknown direction and doesn't hit your tank. Uh, 
Newer upgrades of the T90, however, do not have that upscale active protection system anymore because more modern missiles don't really use a forward laser. They use more intelligent ways of targeting. And so because it doesn't really work anymore, that has now been removed uh, from more modern tanks. And instead, they focused on increasing the protection both of the baseline armor as well as the new ERA that goes onto this vehicle. Go back to that little break in the is that great that so so that did create that effect with the with the type of ammunition that was used back in the 50s and 60s and prior to that. However, with modern long rod rounds, they are traveling at about two kilometers per second. And so when they interact with armor, there's basically almost no reflection whatsoever. It's just like punching a hypodermic needle into skin. And so because of that, the idea of a shot trap, which was fairly for World War II, is not really valid for modern anti-tank rounds. Uh, and in 1997, there was a very interesting uh, initial attempt at putting a hard kill active protection system. So in this case, around the turret, you see this ring of blocks. Each of these blocks is actually a high explosive grenade. And there is a radar sitting on top of the turret such that if you have an incoming missile, it would fire one of these blocks and the block would detonate and put shrapnel in the path of the missile so that it would shred the missile before it had a chance to hit the tank. Uh, similar active protection systems are being developed by pretty much everyone. So Israel has a few of these. Uh, the United States has developed some. Germany is developing quite a few. Uh, and this is because most modern missiles are very, very good at taking out a tank. And so if you can take out the missile before it even hits you, then you're increasing the chances of your survival significantly. And a more modern integration of the same active protection system has focused on basically just integrating it to be a little bit cleaner and to protect the APS itself at least behind machine gun proof armor, because if you hit one of those early blocks with a machine gun, they, they will just detonate and you have lost your protection. Yes, so you train your infantry to keep a certain clearance distance away from the tank to make sure that they're outside of the line of fire. Uh, on the British side, they took that Centurion that they developed at the end of World War II and basically just kept upgrading the gun uh, initially to an 84 millimeter and then later to 105. And this 105 millimeter gun actually became the standard NATO gun. It is still in use to this day, 60 years down the line with tanks all over the world and even with the most recent light tank that the US Army is currently developing right now. Uh, the South Africans have made a couple of modifications to their uh, Centurions where they just added extra composite armor onto the turret so that it improves its protection. Uh, and on the British side, the next generation uh, after the Centurion became the Chieftain. So they kept most of the suspension, same uh, torsion bar, but they made the hull significantly thinner. And they did this by reclining the driver. So typically a driver would be sitting up in earlier tanks. And this was the first time that a driver is basically just laying down on his back. Because of the driver's laying down, you can reduce the overall height of the vehicle. And so if you have an overall reduced height, you can put more armor and increase the protection uh, as well as lower the profile and make it a smaller target for enemy to hit. You can also see that there is very strongly cloaked armor on the turret as well. And in a subsequent upgrade to the uh, Chieftain, they also added what's called still brew, where there's a front uh, plate that has a bunch of uh, internal sheets of rubber and steel. And the, these act very similar to explosive reactive armor but it does not explode. And so the idea that when you have an incoming uh, jet from a shape charge hit the rubber, the rubber expands and essentially absorbs that jet, but there's no direct explosion. So it's safer for infantry who are fighting right next to the tank. So all this innovation in the tank, uh, do they transfer over to civilian life? Perhaps they have to be in material innovation or some other type of you know, right brain innovation or engine innovation? That's made it from the military to the civilian side? Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I will... I suspect that game from another industry. <laughs> yeah. I will say that definitely in the types of computers and sensors that are developed for fire control, there has been some trade-off or some handoff to, let's say, scientific industries but not so much on the civilian market because at this point, tank combat is such a niche uh, field that there's not too much trade-off that you could do for the more mechanical types of solutions. But it's kind of related, right? Because, uh, for example, uh, adaptive control, mm -hmm. uh, that's my, uh, mm -hmm. my research, that's uh, 
for developing during the 80s yep. for a missile control. Yep. We're using up to control uh, airplanes on mm -hmm. every day. Yep. Which was, uh, so it's kind of related. Yep. Yeah, which everything goes in season, but mm -hmm. some things are adapted or uh, uh, goes in some, some way. You know. Yep. Yeah, so it's easier to adapt to electronics and software because it itself is more generally useful than just a slab of armor. Yep. Yeah, so that's what I was attempting to get at. Yep. I will have to do my own research on that because I have had, I've honestly not really looked. Uh, I know that a bunch, so quite a few uh, track vehicles have been adapted to civilian purposes. But it's more because there happens to be a hull that nobody really wants anymore. And so it's transformed into either like a heavy engineering vehicle or in some cases even like a heavy firefighting vehicle. But I haven't really heard of anything that uses a tank grade torsion bar suspension for civilian use. And primarily the reason for that is that if you look at the heavy industry vehicles like excavators and tractors, they don't need to go 50 miles an hour. And so you can use a much cheaper coil spring suspension on like a bulldozer that's on the side of the road and reduce the cost of developing and production. Uh, subsequent upgrades to the Chieftain line became uh, what's called the Challenger. Uh, this now had a much thicker armor, well, armor protection on the front uh, with something called Chobham armor. So this is just a specific uh, ceramic type that was developed by Britain. And because the ceramic is very good, generally people consider that it's able to provide almost like a half meter of effective steel protection uh, on the front of the turret. And later upgrades uh, to the Challenger 2 increase the value that's based in public source uh, sources is discussed as being even as great as 800 uh, centimeters of conventional steel. Uh, on the US side, their first main battle tank became the M60 uh, Patton. This used the exact same 105 millimeter gun that we saw developed initially for the Centurion. Uh, it also had the first uh, composite armor in the hull, but not yet composite armor in the turret. Uh, there was a version of the M60, which is called the M60 A2 Starship, uh, that attempted to have a 152 millimeter gun that could also fire missiles like the Russians. Unfortunately, the missile itself was not very reliable. And so that concept was dropped. And for the M60 A3, they just went back to a more conventional design with a 105 millimeter gun. Uh, in Europe, uh, there was a time that people thought that modern uh, main battle tanks will never have the protection that they need against a large anti-tank missile. And so they focused instead of very heavy armor protection on very high mobility. And so with vehicles like the Leopard 1, uh, the French AMX-30, and also the Japanese Type 74, these have much thinner armor protection, uh, but they have much better mobility. And so the idea that if you're just able to continuously maneuver around, then an enemy missile, which at the time that these were developed had to be guided by a guy with a joystick, would not be able to hit your tank. Nowadays, when missiles are able to just target themselves, uh, that is not really a valid concept. And so these vehicles do still remain in service with some poorer countries just because that's what they can afford. But mainline development has steered away from the idea of, of uh, trading, trading your maneuverability for your protection. Uh, the U.S. and Germany attempted to create a vehicle uh, that was very revolutionary in the uh, 1960s. This was called the MBT-70. It had an actively adjustable hydropneumatic suspension. It had a buckle water loader that was basically a conveyor belt. It had the same 152 millimeter gun that could also fire missiles. And this vehicle was way too expensive. Both nations ran out of funding on development, and they both canceled it. But this led to, on the German side, the Leopard, on the American side, this led to the development of the M1 Abrams. So on the Leopard side, uh, this was a improvement on the basic hull of the Leopard 1, but they introduced a lot of the electronics, especially the fire control that was developed for the MBT-70. Early Leopards had uh, relatively flat face turrets because they were just focusing on slapping on as much uh, composite armor as they could. Uh, but in uh, the early 2000s, they introduced additional space armor on the front. So this is actually a hollow shell on the front. But what it does is it provides an extra bit of space for an anti-tank shape charge to detonate. And within the space uh, in this hollow area, the shape charge essentially has to waste part of its jet traveling over that distance before it hits the actual armor. So it provides a lot of extra protection against an RPG or an ATGM without adding a whole lot of weight. Uh, 
And now there's also a couple of German designs looking at larger guns. So traditionally, uh, Western tanks have been using 120 millimeter guns ever since the Tiefen, and now they're trying to see if they if it would be worth upgrading to 130 millimeter gun. On the U.S. side, uh, the initial Abrams was developed in 1979, and uh, this used the same British Chavum armor that you saw on the Challenger. It used a 105 millimeter gun that we saw the British early developed earlier for their Centurion. And it used a brand new uh, suspension uh, that was also based on a torsion bar, which is stiffer and capable of carrying more weight than what was used on the patent. Uh, so that was already in use on the British uh, Chieftain. Yeah. So this was the first time that this was done for an American tank, but this was not the first time that this was done for a tank in general. Now, why is the Russians still using so that I will talk about this after the talk because it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, uh, in 1985 they upgraded uh, to the M1A1. This now had the Rhein Metall 120 millimeter gun that the Germans developed for the Leopard 2. Uh, this was such a good gun that the Americans also adopted it for uh, their Abrams as well. And then in 1999 they upgraded this uh, as well to also include depleted uranium as part of the armor package for the turret. The reason for that is generally the denser material is, the better it is at both being a penetrator and being armor. And so if now you have modern tanks using depleted uranium penetrators, using some depleted uranium will also help prevent penetration into your own tank as well. Uh, there was an interesting design in 1986 called the M1 TTB that looked at creating a fully unmanned turret with a double concentric grain uh, terrace water loader and putting the entire crew in just an armored uh, armored capsule in the front of the vehicle. At the time, this was considered to be not really necessary because the Soviet Union just fell apart. Uh, and this was very, very expensive to finish developing. Uh, but very similar concepts like this are now being brought back these days uh, because people are seeing that as you increase the armor protection that you need for the crew, it makes sense to just put the crew themselves into a tiny armor capsule and then reduce the armor protection for the rest of the tank. Uh, there was also an interesting design uh, back in the 90s where even the US was looking at upgrading to 140 millimeter gun. Uh, because this was a much, much larger round than the 120, they uh, had to include a aerosol uh, or a bustle and air belt battle loader for this vehicle as well. And this vehicle was tested uh, but again, it was found that is too expensive, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was decided that it's not really necessary at the time. Uh, the same kind of carousel uh, or bustle conveyor belt auto loader has been used on quite a few other tanks. So the French use it on their Leclerc, uh, and they likewise also tried out a 140 millimeter with the same configuration as well. Uh, the South Koreans use the same auto loader on their uh, tank called the Black Panther, and the Black Panther is also unique in the sense that. It is one of the very few vehicles that has top attack ammunition. So this is ammunition that instead of fire flying directly at a vehicle, it flies up to a certain altitude and then attacks the thinner upper armor of a target instead. Uh, the, uh, the Japanese likewise have a very similar autoloader on their Type 10. And the Russians had an interesting concept with their Black Eagle tank where they made the autoloader itself a box. So the box itself could be removed and if you needed to either repair it or just swap out for a fresh auto loader, you could do that with a truck instead of having to replenish every single round by hand. Uh, light tanks uh, were not used quite as much after uh, World War II, but they were still some development. And it was primarily focused on getting the tanks to go to an area where nobody else could go. So in uh, this case, this was an air droppable light tank. And by air droppable, it means that Either an airplane flying at very low altitude could drop a pallet, and this would be strapped to the pallet, and parachutes would be slowing it down. And then once it's landed, your crew would be come would be dropped in by helicopter, and they would undo the pallet and then allow the vehicle to drive around and do its thing. Uh, this was a very, very compact vehicle, so it was actually shorter than one of its crewmen. So it was not very successful, but the same concept was then used on the M551 Sheridan, which was airdroppable, and it was also amphibious, so it was able to uh, cross rivers uh, on its own. And this became the only tank that did use that 152 uh, millimeter gun that could also fire missiles, because by this time, they had uh, a little bit more time to finish development of the missile. And so the missile wasn't great, but it was decent enough of the only thing you needed to do was just fire it at a bunker and blow up the bunker. So I know the Abrams program ran on here. Mm -hmm. The Sheridan one ran on here also? 
I believe so. So Tecum should be in charge of all tank development, uh, at least programmatically. But a lot of the mechanic or a lot of the research development happens at Aberdeen. So the idea is that Aberdeen and Tacom both do research, but then Tacom does all of the programmatic organization. Uh, there were a couple of experiments of putting a very high speed 75 millimeter autocannon uh, onto light tanks. So in this case, this was a 75 millimeter gun fed by an autoloader that could fire around every two seconds. And the idea was that these vehicles would be extremely fast, basically carrying no armor whatsoever, but just getting in uh, maybe to a position where the enemy didn't expect them to and firing at the enemy with their high rate of fire 75 millimeter autocannon from an unprotected or at their sides or their rear armor where they're less protected. Uh, this was the fastest vehicle of the series. Uh, there are also a couple of experiments at making uh, the same kind of tank much lower in profile and uh, also trying to see if you can elevate the gun to high altitude so you can also use it to shoot down enemy helicopters that are trying to shoot you with their own anti-tank missiles. Uh, all of these programs just were scrapped at uh, prototype stage and primarily because the gun itself, it technically worked, but it was not very reliable. It needed to be repaired all the time. And so this was not something that could be readied uh, as an actual weapon for a tank. Uh, instead, the US in the 1980s had an AGS program, which was trying to find a new light tank to replace the Sheridan. Uh, all of these tanks carried the same 105 millimeter gun that we've seen many times already. And there were a couple of candidates. There was a very conventional one from Cadillac Gage that was just a regular tank with a human loader. There was a much more inventive one from Teledyne that had an autoloader with a revolver and then a replenisher conveyor belt so that it had more ammunition without increasing the size of the autoloader to be creatively unreasonable. This tank itself was not accepted for production, but the gun and the autoloader were used in a subsequent vehicle called the M1128. Uh, and the vehicle that technically did win the AGS program was from FMC. Uh, this one had an autoloader that took up half of the turret, and then the other half of the turret had your commander and your gunner. And this vehicle uh, became uh, the XM8, which was approved for prototype until that program was also scrapped uh, just for funding by budgetary reasons. But with the AGS, the idea was that the vehicle itself was airdroppable truly. So here's a couple of photos of it just hanging out under a parachute, uh, could be deployed for a couple of hundred meters of altitude. And in the airdroppable configuration, it was as lightly armored as possible. If you were expecting this is gonna be engaging much more difficult targets, then there was also a series of upgraded armor packages that could be bolted on after the tank was landed and it could go into combat with that extra armor available. And when it's airdrop, it doesn't require any special fortification of the suspension or anything like that, it can take the impact? So when it is airdrop, it is actually airdrop onto a giant inflatable cushion. And so the cushion itself is crushed during the impact and that takes a lot of the a, a lot of the landing energy. Uh, the Russians focused a lot of their light tank development on making amphibious vehicles uh, because during World War II they saw that amphibious operations were the most difficult for them to do. And so early developments of Russian amphibious tanks looked at uh, just very similar World War II style with propellers in the back and just some rudders. But uh, in the 1950s also there was the new technology of the pump jet, just like on a jet ski that was made available. And so this became the uh, winning design for Russia's new uh, light tank fleet. It had two pump jets on either side, so you could cross the cross water at a fairly good speed of about uh, six or seven knots. Uh, it had a 76 millimeter gun, which is pretty much the same as what we saw in the T-34, but now this is a light tank with the same armament that medium tanks had in the beginning of World War II. And this had uh, sufficient amphibious capacity to cross even the... Yes, well... <laughs> That also, but uh, this was used by the Egyptians uh, during the Suez crisis to cross a couple of bodies of water in the Middle East. Uh, subsequent designs looked at taking the same basic idea, but upgrading the gun initially to an 85, 100 millimeter, and finally to 125 millimeter gun. And this is the current Russian uh, design that they're developing as their next generation light tank and or tank destroyer. It carries the exact same gun as their T-72 main battle tank and a very similar autoloader. It is fully airdroppable as well, and it is fully amphibious and can fire off the water. So they're putting a lot of development into creating this essentially as their light, uh, very maneuverable anti-tank force. Uh, the French had one design that actually did go into mass production with an oscillating turret because uh, they did uh, go with a semi-manually operated autoloader on the AMX-13, and this was fairly successful, 
the nations who operated it didn't really assume that there would be nuclear war. So for them, this was a trade off that they were willing to take. And a very similar uh, oscillating turret was then used by the Austrians in one of their uh, light tanks as well. Uh, getting into the next category of vehicles, this is a unique uh, Russian thought process, which was they would have a fleet of main battle tanks, which were your relatively cheap mass produced vehicles. But then they would also have what they call the tank of peak parameters, which would be much more expensive, much heavier, but they would be used in part as your heavy assault tank to support your MBTs against very difficult targets, but also as a proof of concept for new technology. So if you had a new fire control system, you would initially roll it onto your tank of peak parameters. You would then develop it until it's fully, uh, fully trustworthy. And then once it is ready, you would then roll that technology back onto your main battle tanks. And so the first one of these was the uh, Boxer or the Mollet. This one had a very large 152 uh, millimeter gun, as well as a very large round. So here's that person compared to the size of the round. And the idea was that they wanted to have a gun that was so powerful that it was it would be impractical to have any sort of armor protection truly keep you safe from it. An upgrade to this was the Nota, where they had a pair of replenishers sitting right around the driver's seat, and then a revolver autoloader sitting in the turret. So this allowed them to use very large ammunition, but also have sufficient uh, replenishment ammunition to keep uh, to stay in the fight for longer. Uh, there was also a very unusual design called the Object 490B Belka, where the thought was it's maximizing possible protection for the crew specifically from the front. So this design, you had crew sitting all the way in the back, and then the rest of the tank basically acting as protection for them. Uh, as such, the tank would have only been useful in a forward fight, but because the concept for the TPP was that it's only supporting the MBTs from behind their positions, it was not supposed to go in and actually brawl with other tanks of close. Uh, and finally, they settled on a vehicle called the Object 195, which uh, had the same kind of crew capsule that we saw on the American TPP. It had an adjustable predictive suspension that actually had a radar in front and would pre-stress the suspension as it was going over, uh, over train. It had both explosive reactive armor and hard kill and soft kill active protection systems. And it had a same 152 millimeter gun that we saw. So, Oleg, I'm sorry to interrupt, mm -hmm. but I noticed that you have another 100 slides or so mm -hmm. in your presentation. You don't have the time. Okay. Um, do you want to wrap this up? And then maybe we can have a, a second mm -hmm. one next year sure. for the, your last 100 slides, which come to us, come, you know, I noticed that mm -hmm. several of them have. You know the digital age version of yep. it, which probably is more relevant and mm -hmm. interesting to us. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can wrap it up in the mm -hmm. next five to ten oh, minutes. Yeah, we can actually stop right here because this is a good spot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then we'll do a second mm -hmm. part from this till mm -hmm. the end of your slide deck next year, mm -hmm. next year or something. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Can I have one just question? Yes. Uh, is there any part uh, like to convert the tanks or? So the problem with electrification is energy density. For gasoline, if you compare gasoline to, I think like lithium ion batteries, it's about a 10 to one. So you have 10 times more weight for a lithium ion battery that has the same energy content as you have for a gasoline tank. And so, if you do calculations, not even for a tank, but let's say it's a truck uh, that needs to transport cargo over a highway, you're looking at something with 50% of the cargo of the truck being taken away by the battery. And so if you have a 55 ton vehicle, you essentially need another 55 ton platform carrying the battery for it to give it the same kind of range and the same kind of speed that you need. So electrification is being looked at for secondary uses. So let's say if your vehicle is sitting in a protected position, and just needs to use its sensors to look around, but doesn't need to go anywhere, then electrification is very, very good because you can turn off your engine, you can reduce your thermal signature, and you can just sit there and use your battery to look for potential targets. And then if you do find potential targets, then you start up your engine, you go into combat. But as far as actual mobility for your vehicles, that is probably not going to happen unless somebody comes up with a radically better battery. But I don't believe that that is like, physically possible yet. Uh, huh? No, so hydrogen fuel cells actually have even worse uh, volume, uh, volumetric energy density. So they're slightly better on mass energy density, 
but you need a lot more space than a battery in order to have sufficient power out of the fuel cell. Could we do a shorter mission? Like, what if we do like a 24 hour mission instead of a 72 hour mission with a single with my own hand? And you're with much higher speed. Would there be, would there be a, an advantage to be much higher speed? So the issue with doing with developing something specifically for shorter emissions is that you will never have it be used in the way that it was developed. And all the way through World War One, World War Two, you had vehicles that I didn't show in this presentation because they were like secondary uh, isolated examples. But something would be developed for a very specific use case, and that it never it was never used in that use case because the reality of combat is. Sometimes you cannot go back after 24 hours. And typically, you even if you can, it means you have to leave a position which you just established, and then the enemy is just going to come in and take it. And so you have to assume that combat is going to be a lot more intense so that if you are caught in a situation, you're not basically just left with being unable to do anything. Uh, you know, with aircraft, you have enough real estate to land, uh, you know, basically jets on to mm -hmm. the deck. Um, is there any effort to use tanks with its mobility and sort of a flat bed, if you will, real estate, to, to be a drone carrier uh, where these things are able to launch drones to protect it? So there's a lot of development right now for vehicles that carry either drones that can be launched off of a flat deck or drones that can be launched from a tube that unfold after being launched. Uh, that is very new, however, and a lot of that development is still like ongoing. So the concept is entirely valid. And like I myself, I'm very a big fan of the idea of making like a land aircraft carrier, but it still needs more debugging because launching the drone is generally the easiest part making sure you keep a radio communication to the drone when it's over enemy territory and potentially in radio in that environment, that's the much more difficult part. And so what China has been doing, for instance, is they've been launching drones that do a full, fully independent mission where the drone itself acts like a little cruise missile and you just tell it, okay, go over here and hit that. And then even if the drone loses contact with the original vehicle, it still has that mission profile. Whereas for the US, there's still hesitancy in transforming drones into what cruise missiles do already, but that'll probably start being addressed now that people are seeing what's happening in Ukraine, for instance. The, the aircraft, the Navy aircraft carriers, when F-16 goes off the deck, does the ship have continuous radio contact with the, with the, with the aircraft? So for ships, the advantage is that the aircraft itself has a pilot. And so you assume that the pilot is going to make his own decisions as the human operator. Yeah, and so generally you will have contact between the carrier and the fleet of uh, and the fleet of fighters themselves, but because they themselves are crewed, you assume that the person inside the cockpit is the one making those decisions. So the, the Achilles skill is the communication you're saying between the unmanned drone and the, and the base platform? Correct, so it, it's attempting to maintain high quality, high bandwidth, secure communications that are not hacked and that are within an environment where the enemy is using multiple bandwidth jammers attempting to break that data link. Have you talked to Paul Richardson about this? Not yet. Yeah, I mean, there is, there are ways, in rule of thumb, mm -hmm. communicating terrestrially is a lot easier from a clutter standpoint than communicating horizontally. Mm -hmm. uh, so satellite communication, for example, can mm -hmm. have happened at a fraction of the power than mm -hmm. ground to ground. Okay. Uh, so there may be one challenge you would have here, mm -hmm. outside, outside of jamming and all mm -hmm. this stuff, one challenge you have here is your desire to keep a low profile for the base platform. Mm -hmm. And therefore it creates a sort of a, a clutter environment for your link. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, going by some of the other examples of feather UAVs that I've seen, you could create a a mini cell tower, mm -hmm. if you will, from this mm -hmm. that acts as your communication link with with other things that have that have been launched. Yep, and the potential risk there is that enemy have search radars. So once you put up a drone and use it as a radio transmitter, you yourself are a target. And then the enemy can send, can send a missile and hit you. So there's... I mean, I, is, is there a desire to, camera, you know, to, to do camouflage with the tanks? I mean, tanks, by definition, at least in my naive head, cannot be camouflaged. Jesus, the enemy knows you're there. You just overpower the enemy with firepower, right? To some extent. So there is definitely camouflage used on every tank as far as visual before you start moving. Because if the enemy is doesn't know exactly where you are, and when they're looking through their binoculars, if it's just the regular human eyeball, if you can avoid having them figure out, hey, there's a bunch of tanks right there, then it will make your attack more of a surprise because they don't know exactly where you're coming from. There's also a lot of work into thermal camouflage because modern fire control systems use thermal. And so if you have a regular tank just out in the middle of the woods, it'll light up like a giant beacon. And so if you can put thermal camouflage to make you blend in with the woods thermally, then it's much, much more difficult for an enemy fire control system to have a solution on you. Because the other thing is that even if they don't necessarily know where you are, if you have a fire control system that let's say even is visually based, if you blend in sufficiently well with your background so that the fire control system is confused where you are and is not able to get a steady lock, then you've already reduced their ability to engage you. Professor Spunkoff. Yep. And that applies even for tanks. I heard a question from online. Yeah, right here. <laughs> yep. How you doing, sir? I'm good. Hey, um, with today's modern advent of, of increased firepower, uh, both NATO and Warsaw Pact, uh, former Warsaw Pact uh, um, equipment going to large caliber, um, and the, the theoretical uh, limit of armor protection as it sits, mm -hmm. we're already looking at, at the, the future battlefront being primarily um, unmanned. It's 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 inevitable that we're going to start losing equipment. Um, what we're seeing is, speaking to drivetrains that we saw earlier, um, we're looking at a big push for electromotive. So, um, you know, um, electric drives driven by um, direct generator um, combustion, be it turbine, small turbine, or or piston powered. Um, I think that's the key to the future um, now because you get to eliminate some of the highest probabilities for breakdown transmissions, which are heavily engineered and uh, require, you put an independent drive motor on each side of the track. And now all you have is a generator and control uh, package. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing now is kind of the advent of the, and the death of what we're marking out as modern um, uh, main battle tanks, because we know we can't reach an armor limit. If we can go unmanned, we're better off producing light, very lightly armed, cheap mm -hmm. tanks. Um, so the, the theoretical proposition would be that you have tanks running AI, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily AI um, in all modes where it's um, kill anything you designate as a computer um, to, to destroy, but maybe um, temporary link backs for, yeah, for, for, um, for approval of engagement. Um, based on each individual um, um, action, this is this this is one of those things we're going to see come um, to the forefront. And like was brought up earlier, we're going to be dealing with you know the 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 ramifications of that from an ethical standpoint. And and I know you're mainly dealing with the techno technological end here, but but uh, how do you think the U.S. Army is going to have to deal with the, the ethical issues? Mm -hmm. So. That actually is a topic that I was going to talk about towards the end, so we'll probably talk more more in detail. But the slide that I have on screen right now, for instance, is one of the developments that we have been working on uh, at the Army, which was basically a smaller robotic tank, just like you described, with somewhat less armament, but fully unmanned. Right now, the way that the Army is thinking of using them is primarily as support vehicles for your manned vehicles. So these would go out in front of your main force 
and provide scouting. And also if there happens to be an ambush, they will be destroyed in the ambush and there's no people who are lost in the process. But as far as the ethics are concerned, it, it's like I, I myself am probably more of a pragmatist. So I suspect that if there happens to be, Lord forbid, a war where actual American servicemen are killed and in larger numbers than acceptable, then the army will have to take the decision of putting more autonomy onto the robotic platforms. Uh, but right now, what we're seeing from like Ukraine, uh, from Ukraine as well as the Armenia Azerbaijan conflict a couple of years ago, it is absolutely correct that there is a lot of autonomy that is already going on to foreign, foreign weapon systems. And one of the things that I keep on trying to address in my own uh, discussions is a human will never be faster than a computer. And so we just need somebody within, let's say, higher level leadership to come to the decision saying, OK, we will do this carefully. We will do this ethically. But we have to start developing all of these AI technologies to allow for autonomous combat later. Because unlike in World War II, where the only thing you needed for a new tank is just a new engine, some armor, and slap a gun onto it, AI is obviously taking 10 years to develop from start to something that's actually fieldable. And so that's something that I try to emphasize every time that we have, let's say, workshops and we talk about stuff. And I show to maybe some of the visiting uh, personnel to come to our workshops, the videos from uh, systems that do autonomous engagement and point out to them that, look, here's a system that engages 10 targets in five seconds. Uh, you cannot engage that quickly. And so that then makes them start thinking, okay, maybe we do need at least to develop the AI. So if we do have to use it, that is already available. Excellent. Thank you. Um, also along those lines with the with the light tanks, not to deviate, but I probably have to take off. Um, so General Dynamics just got awarded the contract for the MCS. Um, you're probably familiar with it. Um, <laughs> if you're familiar with the original requirements document, it was airdroppable at 25 tons. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if you're familiar with the actual weight of that vehicle, but I assure you it's significantly higher than that. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, as far as I'm aware, the original requirements for the MPF were just a carbon copy of what they did the, for the AGS program. Uh, but when they reviewed the kind of scenarios that the light tank were likely finding themselves in, they came to the conclusion that the original requirement for weight would make the vehicle insufficiently protected and therefore incapable of surviving the scenarios that they were uh, wargaming through. And so they dropped the requirement for airdroppability to focus on increased protection so that in the scenarios that they were playing through war games, it was still surviving and doing what it needs to do. And that's why I brought it up because um, I believe that the autonomous combat vehicles will allow us to have that mission requirement um, um, reasserted to uh, units like the 82nd. Um, so they can have some heavy firepower support that's mobile. Yes, absolutely. So uh, with, with the concept of airdroppable vehicles, there might actually also be another discussion of if you're going with robotic systems, do you even necessarily need a vehicle? Because you can achieve most of the same uh, mission profiles with just a swarm of air, air drones. And so if you're able to do that with a swarm of flying drones, then it might be cheaper to just focus on developing them for all the missions that you might engage in, rather than having to do multiple parallel developments for vehicles that are for, for systems that are redundant. Thank you. Thank you. Quick questions and then we'll adjourn. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that in the RCB bottom right picture, mm -hmm. you have some uh, projections on the ground. What are they? Uh, oh, in this one? Yeah. Yeah, this, as far as I'm aware, was, so I think this was at our AUSA uh, last year, and this was just to make a pretty light show. Well, just no branding. But yes, but they do have the drop-down box that this was highlighting, and the drop-down box has a small pack box size robot. So the idea is that if you have one of these uh, large robotic vehicles going into, let's say, a dangerous urban area, and they're not sure if maybe there is an ambush waiting for them, they can send a small robot to explore. And then if the small robot happens to be destroyed, it's not quite as bad as losing your RCV. And the RCV is already then aware that, okay, there's an ambush there, so they can either choose to attack it directly or can choose to go somewhere else and avoid the ambush altogether. Now, the fact that you don't have a crew to protect mm -hmm. probably allows you to take, take away a lot of the 
the space and the weight, right? Is that the reduction in weight that you see then? Correct. So primarily it's because people are large and computers are very small. And so if you just have an armored box for computers, it's a lot less internal volume. And likewise, you also don't need any of the life support systems that MAN people will use. So that is a reduction of space. The reduction in weight also comes from the fact that you can just put the computer inside of an armored box and just put the systems that you truly care about. So let's say the engine and the fire control system you can put behind armor, but then the rest of the vehicle can be relatively lightly armored because if you have a, let's say a machine gun bullet come in through a plastic piece and then come out through a plastic piece on the other side, but then not really hit anything in the middle, it didn't really do anything. It just made a hole that doesn't really matter. And so there is a lot of reduction in terms of protection because there's you can focus on protecting just the key, key critical systems and reduce the weight of the vehicle, which also helps improve its mobility. Well, thank you again. This is really enlightening uh, and very sort of archival. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I'm surprised that you're able to wrap off all this stuff. I mean, you must be dreaming this stuff. Here. Absolutely. I he, he didn't even have. You know, cheat sheets. He just just came out of them. Oh, this is also the abridged version. The full <laughs> version is about twice as long. Oh boy.